I was reading a report earlier this week. Actually, it was a report written a few years ago. The condition is even worse today than it was a few years ago. The condition of the church and the decline of Christianity in America. The report reads, and it's about seven or eight pages. I'm not going to read all of it. I'll just read, read you parts of it. Are we witnessing the decline of Christianity in America? Well, the obvious answer to that, by the way, is yes. When you examine all the most recent poll numbers, the answer is inescapable. Christian churches in America are losing members rapidly. Certain churches that preach is all about you and how to be a better you, and how can you get this and that for Jesus, those type of churches are growing, or at least staying at the even point. Why? Because it caters to people and what they want to hear. Very few churches. I was reading a few different ones curriculum that is of pastors and churches and how they teach discipleship it's amazing no it's disgusting to see how they've watered that down to basically catering to your flesh and your needs. Instead of die, denying yourself, taking up the cross and following Jesus. The church is in a very sad state, folks. And I refuse to believe if there were more churches that would teach their congregations what true discipleship is all about. If there's more books written about what true discipleship is all about, because this report kind of focused on, in on the youth of America up to the age of th age 34. Basically, they're looking for something. And we looked at the present church, all they offer is the same kind of something that the world provides. And in most cases, not as good as the world. So I don't see much of a difference. More and more churches are saying that, oh, there's multiple ways you can get in and to heaven. Not just by Jesus alone. It breaks my heart. When I read the curriculum, when I analyze and study some of the principles behind some of these groups and churches and what they believe and what they profess. And they're wondering why the church is dying? It really is nothing extraordinary to even give you the reason to join that church in the first place. What's so unique about it? All it has is a church covering, but it's a secular worldly operation. There's nothing unique about it. There's no demand of true discipleship that places what being a Christ disciple on your life is all about. It's been whitewashed. It's been watered down. And it's not effective. It definitely is no training ground produce disciples as instructed to go make disciples
Christian churches in America are losing members rapidly, and this trend is especially dramatic among young Americans. I'm going to skip along here because I don't have time to do this and what I plan to do tonight, which is as part of it. So let's jump along, along, third page of this report. The most recent American Religious Identification Survey, this is back in 2009, demonstrates this fact very clearly. According to that survey, the percentage of Americans who call themselves Christians has dropped more than 11% since 1990. The survey also reports that Catholics, Baptists, and other mainline Protestant churches have, since, have seen very large drop in numbers. However, Islam, Wicca, and Eastern religions, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, showed, showed large gains in the survey. But even more bad news for the evangelical Christianity in America is that those who still call themselves Christians do not necessarily hold to traditional Christian beliefs any longer. Two other recent surveys reveal that the majority of American Christians believe that accepting Jesus Christ as Savior is not the only way to eternal life. Did you hear me? That accepting Jesus Christ as Savior is not the only way to eternal life. USA Today recently reported on an almost unbelievable new survey that found that 52% of American Christians, 52% of people that call themselves Christians here in America, believe that eternal life is not exclusively for those who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. I don't know why this article could keep saying Christian after every uh, associated group. Because they're not. They're not. In name only. A different survey that was taken last year by the Pew Research Center on Form on Religion and Public Life found that 57% of evangelical Christians in America, evangelical Christians in America, believe that, quote, many religions can lead to eternal life. End of quote. Well, Oprah Winfrey had several shows proclaiming that. She's a smart woman. She's a wealthy woman. She's a prosperous woman. She must know something about it. It's bad enough that she believes that. And she has access to millions of people when she had her program when she did this, or said that. But it's far worse. You can't even measure it, how much worse it is that under shepherds responsible for their flock have the same attitude. And then you add the Christians, or in name only Christians, professing. 57% of it, 57% of, of them, many religions can lead to eternal life. Blasphemy. That shocking study revealed what many evangelical leaders have known for a long time. Then why don't you step up and say something about it? Be the under shepherd if you were called to be one that you should be. Don't try to massage their belief system back in something that's even close to what real Christian is. Bring the hammer down in love, but sternly. When Jesus corrected the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even Peter, when he was throwing the merchants out of the temple area. They completed the assignment of the correction that was necessary. And they weren't milk toast about it.
That shocking study revealed what many evangelical leaders have known for a long time. A large number of Christians in the United States are throwing traditional Christian doctrines into the dumpster. They're doing far worse than that. They're twisting it. If they threw, threw it in the dumpster, then I know they have rejected, rejected it and they trashed it. But they're twisting it. They're changing what thus saith the word of the Lord. Into thus saith the word, whatever they have heard from milk toast under shepherds or false prophets and teachers and pastors, or they created it on their own. Which is nothing new. For example, in John 14, 6, Jesus says the following. I am the way and truth and the life. And that hasn't changed. No one comes to the Father except through me. Except through who? Except through Jesus Christ. Stop changing Jesus' own words to fit your own agenda. To easing up the, no, to make it easier, your discipleship path, what you created. Because you want a nicer, kinder, gentler Jesus. And his way, deny yourself, take the cross and follow me, that could get serious. That could be a little bit too, much, too demanding on my life. So therefore, Jesus really means something else for this day and age. They always love to use this day and age. This is what Jesus would say now if he existed now in our environment, our culture, our time period. Spiritual jerks. Forever, O oh Lord, your, thy word is settled in heaven, which cover all time periods. Last time I checked. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If there was another way for our sins to be forgiven, then why did Jesus need to die on the cross? If there was another way for our sins to be forgiven, why did Jesus need to die on the cross? If there were other ways to salvation, then Jesus could have come down to earth, pointed out a bunch of other ways to get to heaven and then could have gone back up to heaven without having to deal with the cross. But the reality is that there was no other way for our sins to be paid for. And yet these new surveys reveal that the majority of American Christians now believe that there are plenty of other ways to get to heaven. The Pew survey referenced above also reveals that 45%, 45% of Americans say they seldom or never read the religion Religious, religion's holy books. Perhaps if more American Christians were actually reading the Bible, they would know what is truth and what is error. Stop calling them Christians. You're insulting my Lord, who defined what that really means. You can't change the terms. The terms are set. Because it's a free gift of grace, you're saved by faith. And that's the starting point. Now you're ready to be molded as a servant, as a disciple for Jesus Christ. Not for your own purposes, for His. I've said it over and over. I haven't changed. And I haven't changed because God's Word hasn't changed. Believe me. I have looked quite often. I must be missing something. There's got to be an easier way. There's got to be a way that fits my agenda, at least part of it, to make it easier on my life. Nope, there isn't. Perhaps if more American Christians were actually reading the Bible, they would know what the truth is and what is error. Instead, American Christians have surrounded themselves with preachers and self-help coaches. Oh, there's plenty of those. Now, self-help coaches. Find yourself someone that you can listen to, because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And faith meaning pistis. 
What is peace this? Hearing and hearing to be persuaded by what you heard to be true, which brings you into the bestial level of faith, which is having trust and confidence what was said that was the truth. The so be it, because God's word says it, I believe it, I trust it, I'm acting upon it, and I'm not changing because my confidence is in him and his word. Instead, American Christians have surrounded themselves with preachers and self-help coaches and feel-good ministers. Plenty of those. They buy old sports stadiums and so they can draw in the crowds. And the crowds come. Why? Because they want to feel good. They want to tell that they're a Christian, yet they don't have to worry about deny yourself. What is that all about? That's something that should have been implied 2,000 years ago. Not today. Feel good ministers who tell them they, what they want to hear, who always make them feel comfortable, and who never, ever tell them about sin, holiness, or the judgment of God. Well, there's more things than that that they need to be taught and told about. But I understand what this writer is trying to relay here in this report. The current situation in the churches of America reminds us of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when man will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. I've been saying that. Nothing new for the viewers that watch me for many years now. The reality is that past generations of America faithfully filled up churches across the nation that were preaching the word of God, but today the vast majority of Americans stay home from church each week. And many of the churches that are still drawing crowds are warring down their messages as much as they can in a desperate attempt to hold on to the people who are still here or there. Why? Because they see how successful the watered-down message is. They keep people in those pews, offering the programs that they want. Same kind of programs you get in the secular world, but you know it's just labeled in, as Christian in the church world. I could go on and on. And it all falls back, and I've said it, yeah, people are people. People are sheep. The problem is the under -ship. The under shepherds that have been produced by liberal, do nothing, Bible schools and universities and seminaries that cater to the youth, especially the last 30 or 40 years, maybe 50 years, and have taught this youth that do go into the ministry something other than what this book our record inspired record teaches it's no different Ezekiel 38 Not Ezekiel 38. Hang on a minute. Ezekiel 34. Dealing with the shepherds of Israel. Ezekiel 34. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. It doesn't say, Son of man, Reason together with the shepherds of Israel? Does it? Do you have a different type of Bible than the one I'm reading? Does it say, Son of Man, prophesy or reason with the shepherds of Israel? No. Does it say, Son of Man, prophesy or pray with the shepherds of Israel? No. What does it say? 
It's one thing writing articles and reports showing us what's happening with the church. There's another thing altogether when you act upon that report and do what God's word says. And it says, son of man prophesy against. Not reason, not pray, but against. Against who? The shepherds of Israel. Well, this is Old Testament. I'll change that somewhat for the New Testament after Christ. For the under shepherds of Israel that have the responsibility, the spiritual responsibility for the flock. Son of man, prophesy against the other shepherds of this world. Let's just put it that way for now. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, or under shepherds, Thus saith the Lord God. If you believe this word, his word to be true, Then take heart. Take the wax out of your ears and listen closely. Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds or under shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds or for our day to the under shepherds. Woe be to the under shepherds that do feed themselves. Oh, they're fat cats for Jesus. And the more the message that they preach that the world wants to hear, especially the professing Christians, the fatter they're getting. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe ye with, 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 with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye... Feed not the flock. The disease have ye not strengthened. Listen. The spiritual disease is what they're re re referencing to. Ezekiel's writing to a people that has fallen away from God. Oh, they still will profess the God of Israel. But for the most part, they've fallen away from God. Either following other gods or ignoring God completely. Or reducing God to their level where God serves them instead of them serving God. They're spiritually diseased. And what do spiritually diseased, what do disease, physical, physical disease people need? They need medicine. They need treatment. They need to be strengthened. In this case, spiritual medicine, spiritual treatment to be spiritually strengthened. Neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken. God's word takes care of all these ailments. But it has to be preached correctly. Listen. And it, <clears throat> I start to worry every time I start preaching. When I start planning, sometimes the plans of what I'm going to preach on Wednesday or Sunday night, I start a few days, days earlier, sometimes the last minute. Not that I haven't planned anything, it's just things change. And I feel I'm spiritually directed to another topic. But I feel every time I sit in this chair concerned because I don't know everyone that's listened to me. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your situations are, and I know some I do because I see your prayer requests and your messages. Many of you I don't. But I know there's so many out there that need spiritual strength. They need these spiritual 
spiritually unbroken. Your sickness, spiritual sickness, needs to be healed. And I know there's physical ailments that go along with this message also. But whether it's physical or spiritual, and the spiritual disease is far worse than the physical disease. Because the spiritual disease has eternity ramifications. A physical is only temporary in the here and now. I sit here and I'm always concerned. God, never let me get in a position where I'm not feeding the flock. Because as soon as that starts happening, take me out of that position and direct the flock somewhere else where they can be strengthened. Now I know some messages mean more than others depending what your circumstances are. And I know I teach on st subjects like the last day series. That necessarily won't strengthen your faith that day or uh, the time I preach on any particular topic. But if you really think about it in the long run, it does build your confidence in knowing that God's word is true because piece by piece by piece is being unveiled to you and you can see it by the verifiable word of God. So it strengthens you in a different way. But as soon as that doesn't happen any longer, listen, I don't want to be here and I definitely don't want you to be here because I do have concern over you that you are strengthened by the word of God not put in a situation or a condition where God's warning his shepherds back in Israel's day and the other shepherds today to find themselves in I've said it for years the conditions that the world suffers the spiritual condition the world is suffering in today starts with the under shepherds. Starts with the under shepherds. You know why there's not true Christian discipleship in most churches? Because it's not presented. It's not presented because, listen, there's a fallout rate. You present a Christian disciple message and you teach on the subject matter Chances are, statistically, only a few respond to the dozens that listen to it. And that's being generous. So you don't want to lose the dozens, so you whitewash, you water down the message to make discipleship a little bit easier so everyone can feel, feel like they are part of being a disciple for Jesus Christ without the demand, too much demand put in place put or place on her life. Woe to you, other shepherds. Woe to you! Neither ye bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. They're scattered. They're dropping like flies in the report I just read to you because there is no other shepherd. Or very few of us left. To handle and reach the masses. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Now Jesus came after this was prophesied and he became our chief shepherd. But our chief shepherd would come, would go, would send a comforter and he established an order in the church world where the under shepherd is supposed to feed the flock. 
Oh, they're feeding them. They're feeding them Twinkies and Ding Dongs. All the sweet stuff. But not the food that gives you nutrition. Not the food that sustains life. Not the food that strengthens the spiritual disease. Like I said, they're giving the ding dongs and the cupcakes and the Twinkies. They're giving what the people want, not what they need. When Jesus says, love one another, he was expressing the same type of love that he had for us, giving us what we needed. Listen, the world didn't want Christ, but the world needed Christ. And his rescue plan. And he's telling us to love one another. And I've told you there's no greater expression of that. Maybe than dying for. For the masses or for the one. And bringing them the word of God. But most of you will never experience that. But you can experience the type of love that Jesus wanted us to express want us to understand that was necessary, giving what people needed, not what they wanted. They needed Jesus, and they still do today. They're dropping like flies because they're not getting Jesus. They're being indoctrinated with the spiritual junk and spiritual programs that are nothing more than secular programs that the world produces, but with a Christian name on it. And because they're so being indoctrinated with this junk, they think that's the norm. And if anyone comes across now and preaches, deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow Jesus, you think we're the nuts, nutty ones. You think we're not preaching the word of God. They're not. And you need under shepherds that come against your thoughts and what you think being a Christian is all about. You want easy street? You're listening to the wrong preacher. You're definitely listening to the wrong website. And you definitely don't want to listen to what God's word says. Glow to you under shepherds. Go to Matthew 16. This is one of those messages that I just... Work my way through as the Spirit leads. Go to Matthew 16. Verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem. And suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Oh, Jesus didn't reason with him? Jesus is just sitting down and saying, Let's just talk about it, Peter. Let's see if we could come to an understanding. Let's pray about it. Woe to the shepherds that I just came from. And Ezekiel 34 says, I come against thee, basically. What did Jesus do? Rebuke them. Then Peter took them and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far. Actually, the Greek is, Pity thyself. Lord, this shall not be unto thee. In one ear, out the other ear. Peter still, being, still placed his hope on being rescued from Rome. Not rescued from sin. Not rescued from eternal damna damnation. Rome. He only saw the temporal. He only saw the here and now. He missed the big picture. the eternal ramifications. And Jesus rebuked them. 
And he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. He knew who the mouthpiece was. That was Peter. But he knew who he was being influenced by. Satan. Satan. Satan didn't want Jesus to deliver that rescue plan. Satan didn't want Jesus to go to that cross. Satan failed in the earlier part of Jesus' ministry after he was baptized. And he went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Satan failed in changing Jesus' mind. Now he's using Peter to be the mouthpiece to see if there's any hope in changing Jesus' mind because he obviously... We're attached to these men now. He was with them. They were his disciples. Maybe they could have some kind of emotional influence on Jesus to change his mind. Satan knew what he was doing. He's no fool. He is, if you really think about it. If you really think about it, he's the ultimate fool, thinking that he could topple Jesus Christ. Think about it. In control. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. You're offensive, you stupid jerk. For thou savest not the things that be of God. Because Peter is looking on to the world and see what would be good for the here and now at that moment. But those that be of men. Peter was just looking for him after Peter was just looking after the things of this world that would affect him and maybe a clo close few people in his family members or friends. How their life could become better if Rome was toppled and removed from Israel. He didn't see the big picture. Why Jesus had to go to rescue a world from damnation if they look upon Jesus and have faith in him and what he provided as redemption for us. Then said Jesus unto the disciples, Here's the tough part. Get ready. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any will come after me, if any will come after me, let him deny. Let him deny himself and take up his cross And follow me. And for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Let me read. Let me read you something. Jesus went on to teach his disciples that not only did he have to go to the cross, but in a sense, they had to go to the cross too. Dying to themselves. Dying to themselves and to their own plans. This was so important to Jesus that he repeated again and again in his teaching. Almost as often as he spoke about the necessity of his personal suffering. He never suggested that his followers could die for sin. Either their own or other sins. Sorry, me dying on a cross doesn't save anyone. Jesus, on the other hand, does. 
He never suggested that his followers could die for sin, either their own or other sins, as he would do. But he insisted that following him meant self-denial. Suffering, rejection, and perhaps even physical death. Not suffering the way you think it, think suffering. That's taught mostly in churches today. And I'll come back to that. The way of the cross is not only for Jesus, but for us. We do not like this kind of teaching. That's an understatement. Prosperity, yes. Victory, double yes. Suffering, death, the cross, boo. Now you've got me turned off. I don't. Jesus does. Walk carefully. We do not like those things. Yet there is no genuine Christianity without them. Self-seeking is the opposite of self-denial. And the problem with self-seeking is that it has been the essence of sin from the beginning. Self-seeking is what caused the fall of Satan. You can see that I've been there before. Isaiah 14. Remember the teaching on Allah? Isaiah 14. Remember all the eyes? Starting with verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Or day star? Some translation. Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which thou which did, didst weaken the nations or the people? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Remember all those? And of course I had a different way of teaching this than most that preach on these subjects, and you have to go to the last day series and find it. But the point I'm trying to make tonight about self-denial or self-seeking, self-seeking is what Satan's all about, is what he convinced Eve and Adam to participate in, which we were born into to be self-seekers. Christ is telling us just to be the opposite, self-deniers. Or you're an I person. How many I's here in verse 13 and 14? One, two, three, four, five. I, 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 I. Well, how did God reply? God replied, you're going to be put in your place. You'll be brought to low. Self-seekers. In the likeness of Satan, verse 15 makes it very clear. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You're going to bring, be brought down. You might not see it in the here and now, but at times coming, you'll see it clearly. See it now, so it's not too late then. What well, was Jesus? response to deny myself in his own personal life. I will abase myself in order that those I love might be lifted from sin to glory. As a result, God promised that Jesus, Christ, would be exalted. He would be given that name which is above every name so that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Self-seekers will be brought to low. Deny yourself, Christians, with Christ. Christ will exalt us in due season.
take up the cross. Not only are not only are we to say to no to self, we are also to say yes to God, which is what taking up our cross involves. Some refer to cross bearing as if it means, and I've touched on this before. Some refer to crossing as if it means enduring what is inedible. But that is not the case at all. Several kinds of things we cannot avoid, such as a physical handicap, a deficient academic background, a drunken husband, and the list goes on and on. People sometimes refer to such inedible limitations as my cross, but they are not crosses. They are not crosses. Real crosses involve the will. They involve saying yes to something difficult for Jesus' sake. There's plenty of scriptures that deal with your inflictions, your trials, your tribulations that encourages you and gives you hope and tells you where do you place your confidence when dealing with those things. But this verse in Matthew is not one of those. Take up your cross for Jesus' sake. What does it mean? I'm suffering for Jesus? No. I've had silly people in my life that said, you know, I'm suffering so much here and now over this, over that, or this. I have to give in heaven because I'm suffering for Jesus' sake. Really? Well, the world in general suffers then for Jesus' sake. The rain falls in the just and the unjust alike. What about the people that do not proclaim to be, proclaim Jesus as God's only begotten Son? What about those people? They suffer quite a bit. Unto death in a lot of cases, especially in third world countries. Is that their interest in the heaven because they suffered? No. No. Or that's making up another way of how you get into heaven. As I touched on earlier. Stop making the excuse. Well, this is my cross. I have to bear it. Well, if you're going to use that, it better be for Jesus' sake. And it better be something that you're suffering, bringing something to someone else. Which I'll get to it. I don't have enough time in tonight's message to elaborate on that. But I will next Wednesday night when I continue this particular message on Discipleship 101. Discipleship 101. cross-bearing in Christ-likeness because what he did it benefited someone else, in this case, the world. Is what we should be viewing what these scriptures mean. Not well, I'm denying myself of bearing my cross or taking up my cross, thinking it's all about your problems. Denying your, yourself usually means that you're involved in participating what Christ wants you to be participating in to benefit others what you already have received and how you can share with them. That's what in his likeness means. That's what loving one another means. Discipleship is not just a catchy phrase. Discipleship is 
puts us on a path. A path that we need to follow, folks. A path that has to be genuine. A path that would take us to the end of what Christ has commissioned us to be a part of. I've said it, I think it was the first month when this ministry started in 2005. Christianity is not just all about you. It starts with you because your personal relationship, as the Christian world calls it, and we'll use that phraseology because many people are aware of that, it has to start with your connection with Christ. I've said it so many times, but I can never say it enough. That connection cannot be severed. That's the John 15 message. You have to keep connected. So many things of this world could be such a distraction that even though you try to convince yourself it's not disconnected, it is. Because it takes you off the path what Christ has commissioned you to be a part of. And listen, some of the distractions can be heartbreaking, destructive, confusing, disastrous, life-changing. And then you'll start justifying to cope with those things that you're not severed with the connection because you learned a few words or you pick up scripture and just read a few verses here and there. It's severed. And there's two ways it gets severed. The first and foremost important way is when your connection is broken with the relationship you have with Christ. And that means taking the time and saying, you know what? No matter comes, what comes my way, what crosses my path, that connection is not going to be severed. I'm going to stay connected. I'm going to stay in His Word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to participate. Because the second part of that commandment in John 15 is to keep that love for one another alive and well. And then the promise for the ones that have that type of connection, severed with Christ on their personal relationship with Him, because you cannot be nervous, nourished if your vine is severed. You'll dry up and you'll die, and you'll be just as good as dry wood that's thrown in the fire. It just gets burned up. And once it's gone, it's gone. That's not the condition you want to find yourself in. You have to keep the connection. And you know what that means for you. But it's not only about you. Well, why does, not, why does the Lord give me a break? Doesn't he see how much I have in my plate? Yeah, he does. And I'm with you. I ask those questions on occasion too. Come on, Lord, I'm not that fat. I don't need such a big plate. Take some away. Well, maybe he thinks you do. For whatever reason that he has. Listen, Peter says, you're going to be tried in the fire. And once you get through that fire, you're going to be more precious than gold. It didn't say that tried by the fire is only going to happen once in your lifetime. There's no condition of that in his letter. 
He didn't say once, twice, twice, three times. I wish he did. Because he only said once, twice, or three times, even a half a dozen times. I would make sure I find enough trials by fire to get to that magic number six so I know after that there will be no more trials. No more fire to go through. I'm there. I have arrived. It doesn't work that way. God has not worked that way. You're a work in progress. You are to be tried by fire to the day he takes us home. Like it or lump it, that's the process. If you're looking for a spiritual vacation, you've come to the wrong place. When I, when that place I'm mentioning is God's word, the truth. You've come to the wrong place. You're better off trying to find some other religion that you think it might get you in, even though it won't. At least it might be easier for you in the here and now if that's all you desire. That's why Jesus said, count the cost what you can build. Count the cost. Meaning that it's going to cost something. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. More than likely, there's going to be persecutions. There's going to be sufferings. And you want to intensify that? Wait a minute. I don't, let me shut my ears off. Let me plug them. So at least I can have this excuse I didn't hear what you said. Well, I'm going to say it. You want to intensify all those things that I mentioned? Become a participator in getting to others. What you already know. I'm not calling you out to be a preacher. I'm not calling you out to go evangelize. But find ways of participating. Find ways in participating. So you can follow the second commandment of that chapter. Love one another. Remember my definition for love. Giving them what they need. They need Jesus. A disciple not only is concerned with his own spiritual growth and connection with Christ, but others also. Especially the ones that need to get the message that Jesus saves. And to other already Christians that need to grow in Christ, to have the mind of Christ, to know what does say the word of the Lord without all this spiritual junk and nonsense that's floating around today in the church world. You have a great responsibility. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop with the self-pity. Stop with the woes me. And I'm only repeating to you what I tell myself all the time. Stop desiring another path or a different journey. Step up to the plate that God has dished out to you and say, with God all things are possible. He has me on this journey. He has me on this path. He knows what's going on. I'm a disciple of his. I will stay connected. I will, keep, I will keep myself nourished by his word, by keeping that connection. And I also will do what Christ has asked us all to do. Nourish others. Either you preach it or you support it in the ways Whoever is preaching it, rightly divided, is asking you to participate in. You don't really have a choice. Because if you think you do, then you never got past to deny yourself in, verse, in Matthew 16. 
Forget take up the cross. You're not even past deny yourself because you're still self-seeking a different path, a different journey. And this is what's missing in Christianity today. It's not teaching true discipleship that we find in the New Testament. Woe to you under shepherds that have fallen to your responsibility and have gone the way of the world. Your sheep, I mean your wolves and lambs clothing. God get to you. But for those of us that are true disciples of Jesus Christ, that just puts more responsibility on our plate, not less. As I tell people around me, and you might think this is harsh, suck it up. You've been called to participate in something that gives honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Quit your self-pity. And be ye good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Now, I've only begun in this message, but I've run out of time. I want to hear from you. You know, I want to know if you're going to be around Wednesday night as I continue this. Play the song.